Hello, students of marriage and kinship, and welcome back. Last time, we talked about different kinds of kinship systems in some really general terms, and we also started looking at kinship charts, but today we're going to look more seriously at different kinds of kinship systems, how they vary, why they vary, and what chart making can accomplish for anthropological research. So why make all these charts? Just imagine for a moment that you are on your own studying a new society. Why might you attempt to draw out family trees for as many people as you can? What might you learn from it? One obvious answer is that it's the best way, or at least a really useful way, to represent the kinship systems of different peoples. So again, by kinship systems, we mean which relationship terms are used by or for which relatives. And seriously, I can tell you there are some really important kinship concepts that only make sense to me in a chart. If I try to talk about it with words, it makes no sense. The chart just really helps me visualize the structure. But in order to understand this kind of importance of the chart, that it helps you visualize the structure, maybe it would re-help to visit some different kinds of kinship systems. Like I said, we talk about them in more detail in this lecture. So. Let's look at what is often called lineal kinship. And this is very similar or pretty much the same as Morgan's descriptive kinship. So it distinguishes lineal relatives from collateral relatives, parents and children from siblings, parents, siblings, parents, parents, siblings, etc. It tends to be associated with nuclear families, because if you look at a lineal kinship chart, and we'll do that in a moment, the nuclear family is really at the center of it. This is how English kinship works, um, generally very similar to Russian kinship, and very similar to the kinship system you'll find in most modern industrial societies. So here is my own hand-drawn kinship chart. So you can see in green, you have the lineal relatives, and in red, you have collateral relatives. And you can see that if Ego had children and I drew them, they would be in green too. You can see that the nuclear family is really centered here. All right, next we have bifurcate merging kinship. Bifurcate merging. Bifurcate means split into two. Merging means that also things are put together. What could this mean? Basically, the mother and the father's side are split in this type of kinship, but same gender siblings are grouped with parents. So the mother sister and the father sister are totally different kinds of relatives because they're on different sides of the family. But the mother and the mother sister are both called by the same term, and the father and the father's brother are both kind of the same thing. They're called by the same term. And we saw a system like this in the Yanomamo kinship chart from last time. This is associated with unilineal descent groups. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Let's look at the chart. Imagine that you're growing up either in a patrilineal or a matrilineal family group. If it's a matrilineal family group, you'll be growing up with your mother, your father, who comes to live with your mother's group, probably. You'd be living with your grandmother, and you'd be living with any of your mother's sisters. So they're all around. Maybe there isn't that much of a difference between your mother and her sister. And so you both call them mother. All right, now let's talk about generational kinship, which we saw in the Hawaiian example. In this system, everyone in the same generation gets the same 
kin term, although they're often grouped by gender. So maybe everybody in the parent generation is mom and dad. Everyone in the grandparent generation is grandma and grandpa. Everyone in the child generation is son and daughter. Everyone in your generation is brother and sister. These are associated with ambilineal societies and foragers because foragers often meet up and then split off into different foraging groups throughout the year. And you want to be able to draw on any and all kinship ties that are available so you don't make huge distinctions between relatives. Here again is my hand drawn chart. As you can see, this is what Morgan was talking about when he talks about classificatory systems merging the collateral relatives with the lineal relatives. The collateral relatives are there. More of them are turning green because more of them are being referred to with the same kin terms as your genetic father, genetic mother. All right. One more system bifurcate collateral kinship so in this system like bifurcate merging kinship the mother and father side are split but there's no merging of groups of relatives rather you get unique kin terms for every kind of relative so the mother's sister is not only a separate kind of relative from the mother she's also a different kind of relative than a father's sister in a descriptive system, right, you have aunts who are a parent's sister, and it doesn't matter which side. But in bifurcate collateral, you have mother's sisters, father's sisters, mother's brothers, father's brothers, and they're all different. Kazakh does this, and this is the rarest type. And frankly, I find it really hard to um, visualize, except by trying to give every different kind of relative a slightly different color, because every relative gets a unique term, or at least every type of relative gets a unique term. So have we answered the question yet? Why do we make all of these charts? Well, OK, some other things that you can learn from making charts. They allow you to study the theory and practice of marriage. Because usually you are looking at married couples, affines, right? Um, we talked about this before. You're looking at affines as well as genetic consanguineal relatives. So you can look at how many polygynous marriages there are in this society that you've been dropped into. Or you could look at how many polyandrous marriages there are. You could see maybe which family groups are exchanging spouses with which other family groups. What kinds of alliances are being made that help to structure this society? You could answer, if you took genealogies from everybody you encountered, what types of marriages are most common. And you can also answer this really practical question, which is to what extent does behavior line up with what your interviewees say marriage should be? If you interviewed a bunch of people in this society, they'd probably tell you something about their ideals of marriage and blah, 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 blah. But when you actually look at the marriages that happen with the genealogical charts, you can say, wait, OK, everybody says this, but everybody is actually doing this other thing. Maybe that's a little obvious, though. So what else can you learn? You can track rules of descent and inheritance. And when we talk about in inheritance, we mean both property and social positions. You might learn about magic, religion, and ritual. So perhaps only certain kinds of relatives can perform certain kinds of ceremonial functions. Or you might find out that the names of the dead may be taboo, and nobody will tell you the names of dead people so that you can put them on your chart. 
Alternately, if you come from a tradition like mine, where you're supposed to name your children in honor of dead relatives, but only dead relatives, it's bad luck if you name your child after a living relative, then you might be able to see who children are being named for and maybe which relatives are being honored. You would find out some basic demographic information, so who makes it to adulthood, who gets married, how many children do they have, etc. You would be able to confirm genealogies across interviewees. Every interviewee, even if they're part of the same family, might give you a slightly different version of their kinship chart. Maybe different family members know different things about distant relatives. Maybe somebody knows more, somebody knows less. Maybe some relatives are more important to one interviewee than another. And so you can really get the whole picture by interviewing multiple people from the same family. And then, of course, you can also understand the psychology of how people relate to each other. How does the kin terminology actually sort of play out in how people understand their relationships with the people on the chart? Okay. So assuming that I've convinced you that charts are useful, how would you go about making them? You will want to distinguish marriages, divorces, deaths, descent, and collateral relationships. It is helpful to have some way of distinguishing male from female and also a way of marking additional genders where those are present. If somebody is non-binary, if somebody is two-spirit, you want to be able to do that somehow. Typically we do this with shapes and you might also want to add some additional information such as the person's name, the applicable kin term, the actual relationship. Um, there are some older scholars of kinship who talk about finding out like, okay, so you call this person mother and you also call this other person mother, but which one is your real mother? Um, which sort of presumes that the kin system that a person is using is suspect and not real. Um, but nonetheless, it might be useful to distinguish like, okay, both of these are your mothers. Who gave birth to you? Um, you can find out who's adopted. You can note social groups that people belong to. If we were doing it for ethnic Kazakhs, we might want to note maybe their Zhuz or their Ru. We can perhaps note where each person is from in order to trace patterns of migration or residence. Finally, when you conduct your interview, you're going to want to elicit a lot of different kin terms in order to understand how the system functions. Even if these are relationships that maybe a person actually doesn't have in their chart. So you're going to want to know basic terms like father, mother, son, daughter. You might want to know about whether there are age differences and how you talk about brothers or sisters whether the side of the family matters, um, father's brother, father's brother's wife, father's brother's child, father's sister, right? All of these different detailed relationships to see who is grouped together and who is made distinct. And also how marriage is treated in the system and how we relate to affinal relationships as opposed to consanguineous relationships. So I hope this has helped you understand why kinship charts are useful things so that you can go forth and work on your semester project. I will see you virtually next time. Thank you for sticking with me.